Hey guys, welcome to another Let's Play. As you can probably tell by now, I am not in the Xbox, nor am I in any type of game console. No, I am on my desktop computer, and today we're playing Flight Simulator 10, or Flight Simulator X, whatever you want to call it. Uh, we'll be doing a short flight, and I'll show you uh, one of my favorite games when it comes to... Uh, probably the game that I've spent the most time in, and that is Flight Simulator. So we'll get started here, and I'll show you everything uh, that I can to get you started and kind of explain a lot of things. Uh, first off, let me explain where we are, what this is, and what we're doing. So where we are right now is we're sitting inside of a Boeing 737-700 made by the wonderful people over at PMDG. They make wonderfully realistic aircraft for Flight Simulator. It's very fun to use because you get a real, real, real realism from it, which I really like. Uh, and we are sitting in, once again, like I said, a 737-700. I'll show you guys the outside right now. This is an Alaska Airlines paint because we are at Seattle Tacoma International Airport, or SeaTac for short, for those people who live in Seattle. That's what we call it, SeaTac. Um, this is the plane that we'll be flying today. We are going to be flying from Seattle to Spokane. It's about a 40-ish minute flight, which should give us enough, enough time to explain a lot of things, talk about some things, make this Let's Play, and of course uh, show you and explain all this fun stuff. So we'll be taking this plane. Um, this is a realistic flight, meaning that this is a money-making flight that Alaska does fly every day, but they do not fly usually the 737-700s. No, they usually fly um, the Dash 8s, and I believe they're made by DeHoven, or the 737-400s or 500s, which are the smaller versions of uh, this plane, and this is the smallest plane that I happen to have uh, with my favorite livery, which is the Alaska Airlines paint once again. So let's head on inside, and I'll talk about some of the different controls and what we're going to do right now. So as you can probably see, if I look down here, you'll see that all of my instruments and control panel is dark. And what this is called is called cold and dark. So this is basically, you know, when you go inside, you turn your car off and you basically leave it overnight. Uh, you know, everything's off. So I am basically coming in in the morning and I now need to turn everything on. So we're going to do that right now, which is a short and simple process. And we'll get going really fast. So first off, we're going to head into the overhead panel, which is this one right here. And we're gonna go ahead and turn on the battery. And that battery is a temporary power source for being able to power some of the electronic equipment inside of the plane. But that allows us to go into here, which is our FMC. You can see it down here in the bottom right. We're gonna go into our flight simulator actions and we're gonna add some ground connections, including that ground power and air conditioning. So we'll be able to power the plane now with ground power allowing us to access all of our controls plus we'll be able to cool down and uh, air condition the plane to our liking so we're going to do that by opening up our isolation valves and turning on that recirculating fan now that we're running on ground power we're not necessarily using the battery but the battery is on so it's kind of a, a step through when powering everything on so we're done right now within the FMC. We're going to go ahead and get the plane kind of warming up, ready to go. Now, if you looked outside, you saw that our little sky bridge, our, our loading bridge here, is connected to our plane. And basically, this would be the point where the people are boarding onto the plane. So we're basically in that process right now. People are boarding the plane, so we're getting the plane ready to go. And to do that, we need to do a couple things like I talked about. First off, we need to start with warming up our windows. Uh, if your windows are cold, they will shatter easily, and if things hit them, they'll be easily shattered. So we warm up the windows, basically, for pilots. Um, to one, keep the ice off, and two, if something were to strike those windows, it would be a little bit more of a balancing off than a shattering of the windows. And then, of course, we're also going to arm these emergency lights, which that's a necessary thing that we need to do when we come in in the morning. We're also going to go look up here a little bit more. This is the way, 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 way up panel. And we're going to turn on our IRSs. Our IRSs basically help us find where we're going in the world. So we're going to put those into nav mode. And you can see it goes on DC. 
We're going to wait for the left one to turn into a line, and then we're going to turn the right one on and make sure it turns into a line as well. Then we'll head back on down to that FMC, and we'll be able to start setting things up from there. That stuff is basically set up through the FMC so that we can get our route in, get what we want done into the FMC. And this is also the point where we are going to set up our FMC as well, so we're going to head into there. Now, in real life, the IRSs would take about 15 minutes to align, and that's so that it can get an accurate measurement. Now, of course, this is a flight simulator, and so the simulation, we turn it down to about 15 seconds, so we should be able to go right about now. So, let's start with our position data. We are starting at KSEA for Seattle. And we're going to go into our route, and we're going to go from Seattle to KGEG, which is Spokane International. We're going to go into our departures and arrivals, and we're going to depart. I believe the runways running today are the 3-4s. We're going to take off 3-4 center, because we're different. And we're going to take the uh, Mountain 6 departure, which uh, proves to be a very nice departure for this type of flight. We're going to arrive, and I believe we're going to go ILS-03, uh, maybe. Let me go check here. I happen to actually have uh, the charts up to see what the active runways are right now. And how I do this is that I use a program called Flight Aware. Uh, it's called flightaware.com. You can actually look up actual flight routes and flight data. So it's really how I base most of my flights on. And I can see that, yep, it looks like... Yeah, it looks like they're using the 03 runway tonight. So we're going to go ahead and use that runway, which uh, is a nice runway. It's going to be a nice straight-in approach. So we're going to select 03. We want to use the Zoom R1 because I, I know this in my head. It's a general route that I know because I've done it multiple times within this game. EPH, we're good there, and Yee Club there as well. So now that we have this route set up, it isn't set up all the way. There's still some things that we need to add. So we're going to come down here into our map which is this uh, second uh, dial here, uh, or second screen in from the left, and we're going to be able to view our route. So I've zoomed in there. We're going to move the map into plan mode, so we'll be able to see and plan our route successfully, so we'll be able to land with the minimal amount of effort. So we're going to step through our route right now. We'll take off, and then we'll make a right-hand turn, and from there we'll go uh, not in a vector, but we are going to go to NEZUG to EPH, then to Zoom R. Then from Zoom R, we actually want not to go to Gangs, but we're going to go to Yee Club like I had put in before, and we're going to replace that. So we'll be able to step right on through into the approach path of the airport. And from there, we'll be able to land. And then if we miss it, there is a holding pattern at the end of our legs. So we'll be able to circle around and be in that holding pattern if we run into any trouble. But from there, we're gonna click that activate button and uh, our route plan is active now. But now what I need to do is I need to go into my flight simulation data and we're gonna change around our fuel and payload. <laughs> Let's make this about a 90% full flight. It'll be a pretty full flight, which it is, because Spokane is a great airport, but not a lot of flights fly out of there. So a lot of people in the Spokane area, basically in the eastern Washington area, go to Spokane International Airport, then fly to Spokane to Seattle, and then out to their destination. So usually the back and forth between Spokane and uh, Seattle is a big ticket item for a lot of people. So will be a pretty full flight. And for fuel, I believe we need 12,000 pounds or just thereabout. We'll have enough fuel. It's not a very long flight. Once again, like I said, about 40 minutes. Now we're going to take that weight, uh, which you just saw me click through really fast, but that weight uh, is 127. That is 127 tons, I believe. So that is our gross weight of the plane. We're going to put that in our preference initialization data. So basically we're telling the plane, you're this heavy, so you'll be able to calculate everything that we need, like our planned fuel, uh, how long it'll take to get there, what sort of data metrics that we need. We basically told it there. So from there, we're going to move on and go into our reserves. Our reserves fuel is basically that number that we set that if we get to that number, we need to find somewhere to land. So I set that about a five. Now our cost index is basically how efficient we want to get to the airport. We're going to use about a 25. It's not really 
time consuming, but it's not also uh, fuel consuming as well. So it's right, a nice moderate one. And it, you can see here that it's suggesting us a flight level of 286. We're actually gonna go to 285 because that's what I've pre-planned for us. We're gonna hit that execute button to enter that information to the FMC. So now it's holding onto that data and it knows everything that it needs to know from there. Our N1 limits are basically how fast we take off, which is just fine. Now our takeoff, we're going to set up everything there. We're going to use about 10 degrees of flaps is what I like to use. Uh, we're also going to use our center of gravity, uh, and we're going to also put in our V speeds. Now our V1 speed is basically that speed of uh, your lowest, un I believe it's your lowest unstick speed. So at 116 knots is the lowest that we can unstick from the runway at. The VR speed is our optimal rotation speed, so when I'll pull back on the stick and then v2 is our no return so those data in as well as our trim data which we need to be at 4.89 and that's when we'll go down here to our pedestal where our gear our, not our gear lever excuse me our thrust lever is and we're going to go ahead and move our uh, rotation when uh, wheel to our trim stabilizer of about 489. That will help us take off uh, in a timely manner. So now our FMC is pretty much set up. So we're good there. So we're going to go back to that main page. Now what we do need to do though is set up our preference for our altitude, which is right here. We're going to take off at 285, or we need to go up to altitude 285. So we'll set that up here. And then we're also going to set up our speed to 1. Eight five, which should be a good speed to kind of uh, be meeting at. Now you can see it's kind of getting uh, sunsetty, so I want to you know take off in a timely manner so we can fly into the sunset and we'll hopefully make an evening approach or just there about. It might be a little bit darker once we get there, um, but other than that. We're all set up basically for this plane to take off. I know you see all those emergency lights on, but they're not anything to be worried about just yet. Only when we get our uh, our engines on we need to extinguish all of those lights and we're going to start that process right now so basically everybody's loaded onto the plane we can now start our uh, departure sequence so now if i go back to our overhead panel there it is we're going to start our uh, sequence to start up our apu which we're going to turn on our fuel pumps and we're going to start up your apu you're going to see that uh, our pressure will start to rise on that dial uh, that's at the bottom of the screen right next to the L wiper um, and that is basically what um, allows us to see that EPU running and the pressure so that will take a little bit and from there uh, we will start setting up but one thing that I did forget which we'll do right now as it's starting off is we're going to turn on our panel lights so we'll be able to get nice illumination for everything and see what we're doing while we're flying because of course we want to see what we're doing while we're flying right of course we do so we're going to turn those on there's about three different three or four different knobs that we want to fly here and as you can see there's a plane actually moving out uh, of the hangar or of the parking stall and and I have AI aircraft installed, uh, which take off and land and do different flight plans. So it's more like a realistic experience, which I really do like. So that plane just left. We'll be leaving practically right behind it as soon as we get that APU generator on. As you can see, there's now a new light that's been illuminated right here on the APU gen uh, setting on our bus transfers in that bottom kind of left handy area. We're going to now transfer our power to the APU and then we're going to come in here back to our FMC go into our FS actions and now we're going to remove ground power plus we're going to remove that air conditioning. So now we're in the plane under our own power. From there, we can now get ready to go. So to do that, we're gonna come back into our virtual cockpit here. Our sky bridge is still attached, so we're actually gonna command it to retract because all of our passengers are in, buckled up and ready to go. So we can now start our sequences to back up and uh, turn on everything. And to do that, I am going to initiate our uh, backup tug here you'll see it 
move into view as uh, we start to push back. Now, as we're pushing back, we're going to start up the engines. So basically, we're using bleed air or air that's being produced by the APU to start up these engines. And to do that, we just turn that on and some of that air is going to be uh, redirected into the engines, which is going to start turning that turbine. As soon as it gets up to a good speed, we can introduce fuel and it'll start right up. So we're waiting for the number in this bottom center console right here, which I'll bring up as you can see, uh, it to get above 20. And once we do, we can start up that engine. I'll actually change our views here because I've got lots of views. You can see that engine starting to turn on right now as we get pushed back from the gate. So that engine should be turning on very soon now. Uh, it, it, it doesn't take too much to start up uh, some of these engines. Uh, and so we're almost uh, all backed up here as well, too. So we'll be probably sitting on the ground as, uh, for a little bit while we get uh, everything uh, turned on. So we are good with our pushback sequence. So we'll go ahead, set our parking brake, and that engine is on. So we'll start turning on that second engine as well. Same process there. We're waiting for it to get above that 20 mark, and then we'll be able to uh, turn it on. So let me take a drink of water real quick. Ah, because I'm talking too much. And we will get ready to go very soon here. Waiting for it to turn on. Great, we're above 20, so we can go ahead and introduce fuel into the system, and you'll see that number slowly start to rise here. I'll bring this up. So this is basically the panel that I'm talking about. You can see it. Um, it's up to 30. Uh, slowly going up there, it'll, it'll start going faster as soon as the turbine really gets spinning, and we'll be able to uh, get going here. So if we're just about there, we will have the uh, the upper panel here these these knobs that I had turned to the left are now up right again so now what I can do is I can turn those on to continuous as well as turn on some lights we want our anti-collision our wing and our taxi lights on now because the engines are on we can also extinguish all of these yellow lights we'll do that by flicking on their respective switches like so and at this time as well, we're going to transfer our bus power or our power of the plane from the APU to the engine so that we can turn off that APU and run OK. And then we're also going to turn on our packs as well, which provide air conditioning to the plane, keeping it a nice ambient temperature. And uh, we're ready to go. Only one more thing to do before we take off here is to turn on our transponder, which is this... Uh, this dial right here that you can see the numbers changing to 1203 and that is our transponder we're also going to turn on some things on the map including our terrain so we can see the terrain around us some data and the traffic around us as well and uh, guess what we're ready to go we're gonna oh, as I hit my microphone we're gonna unhitch our parking brake and add a little bit of thrust and away we go so we're heading off to 3 4 Center, I believe. That's that, that's uh, correct. I'm trying to remember in my head here. Uh, 3 4 Center, which we'll uh, head off to right now. And as we're doing this, we're going to flick off our RTO switch, which you just saw me there doing the bottom right. Uh, the RTO switch is basically the rejective takeoff switch. So if we have to do an emergency uh, stop uh, when I... Uh, when I slam on the brakes basically it'll help me slow down a little bit faster so as you can see here we have a alaska airlines plane already taxing out to the runway we'll be following it down although i think it's going to be taking off at three four left we're unfortunately going to be taking three four center which happens to be a great runway for taking off and that's how uh, everybody usually does it uh, at the seattle airport is they usually use the center runways for a takeoff and the left runways for uh, landings when in this configuration. Uh, and this is the configuration for the three fours. For the one sixes, it's a little bit different. For the one sixes, the one six lefts are the takeoff runways, and the one six centers and the one six rights are actually for the approaches aside from the heavies. The heavies always have priority on the longest runway, which is the one directly to our right. So, 
we're going to continue heading on down is I think you can see there that it's starting to become a sunset, a really nice sunset. So we'll have a really nice view uh, as we come off. And it might be a little darker once we head on into the night. So hopefully uh, we'll still be able to see things okay. But as you can see out there in the way we, we distance, you'll see those lights down. Those are actually planes coming in for a landing, which look pretty cool. So... Uh, like I said before, this is a real money-making flight for Alaska Airlines. Uh, this is a flight that they do on a pretty regular basis. I mean, they fly from Seattle uh, to uh, Spokane at least 10 times a day. I would say at least 10 times a day, if not more. Because, it, again, like I said, it really does connect the inner... Washington to all of the international flights. So right now we're going to be holding short of this runway because I believe this plane to our left right here is about to take off. So uh, we give it uh, the right of way, or basically it gets the right of way as it goes to take off right there. You'll see it spinning up here and uh, it's heading off. So uh, as it goes past us, we will see it head on through and as it does that we are going to add a little bit of thrust here and uh, head off now as we're also approaching runways we're going to put down our flaps which will help us take off faster so we'll see this flaps button going all the way down to 10 degrees of flaps which will give us enough so that we can take off in a short, timely manner from this runway. So, again, I think we're going to hold short here because I think we have some aircraft inbound. Uh, we'll see here. Yep, we've got a couple aircraft inbound, so we're going to stay holding short as, uh, yep, one aircraft is coming in, it looks like. Uh, sometimes the AI is a little bit off, uh, meaning that uh, they'll come in stacked on top of each other and do uh, go rounds in a very unprofessional fashion. But that's just, just how the AI works. It's not perfect, but it's something that, you know, adds a level of realism to it. So I'll take another drink and this plane will be landing in front of us here. And if I'm lucky, we will add a bit of, you can see it land, we'll add a bit of speed here and then we'll bring up our overhead lighting panel turn on our landing lights because we're entering the runway and we'll turn on our strobe as well that strobe is basically something that brings attention to us from pilots so they'll be able to see us and as we turn on to the runway we want to line up with that center line uh, something that's really cool in the Alaska Airlines planes is actually have HUDs, uh, heads-up displays. You can see our heads-up displayer that I just brought down right here, which will help me line up with this runway. And we're waiting for that plane to get off of the runway, and we'll hit our N1 uh, and our, our, our takeoff go-around switch, which happens to be really weird in this plane because it's really weird uh, in the 737. It happens to be a screw on the faceplate of the... Uh, MPC panel, which is basically what controls our autopilot. So uh, I hit it and we're off and rolling, roaring down the runway here as I get my, uh, go straight here. I'm using my rudder here, 80 knots. And this is the most critical point. So I might be a little bit quiet. We hit V1 rotate. and now we're hitting V rotate. So we're now getting off the ground here and since we have a positive rate, I'm going to say gear up. Our gear is going to come up, and we're climbing on out. And you can see we have somewhat of a crosswind since it's blown me to the left here. And I'll just go ahead and kind of nudge my controller to the right as we pass through that magic number that allows me to activate the VNAV and the LNAV. Now, the VNAV is basically for vertical navigation, and the LNAV is for longitudinal no, longitudinal navigation. <laughs> Funny words, right? And basically these navigation points allow us to, uh, or allow the autopilot basically to engage and says that it's going to control both our vertical speed plus our uh, direction that we're going. And you can see if I zoom in here, we're following that pink line. That pink line is uh, something that we will be following throughout this flight. 
Now I'm going to go ahead and put up those flaps that I had put down. So I'll give you a nice side view of that and also that amazing looking sunset. I mean, look at that sunset. It's amazing. That is actually an add-on pack. I, I use actually a lot of add-on packs for Flight Simulator to increase that realism. You can see our front slats are starting to slide into the wing, making it look a little bit more aerodynamic because we're at enough speed where we don't need the extra lift. And now it's fully retracted into that wing as we have that nice sunset, like I said. So let's head on back into the cockpit here, waiting for it to load up. Sometimes it takes a little bit. We are currently climbing out past 3,800 feet, still climbing. We're going all the way up to 2,800 feet or 2,805 feet. Take another drink of water there. And we'll be turning or making our turn right very shortly here, which will put us on track to get up to our cruising altitude, which shouldn't take too long. We'll actually we'll get up to our cruising altitude and then start descending pretty fast, actually. So uh, it won't be too long now uh, until we do that. So here we go. We're making that right hand turn. Like I said, really don't need this HUD anymore. So we'll just look out the front of this plane. Uh, you can see the wonderful suburbs of Seattle as we go around and then that mountain range, range, not rage, into frame here. Now, I have been flying this aircraft for a long time. I think I've got a couple hundred, not even maybe a thousand hours into flying this plane. So I have all of the procedures in my head, but I also do have notes that I do keep in front of me. Um, that help me with checklists. I mean, flying a plane is just a lot and a lot and a lot and a lot of checklists. Uh, everything from making sure that your lights are off at the correct time and everything including, you know, making sure that you're following all of your procedures. There's a lot of stuff uh, that goes into flying a plane and, and it's something that I'm very, very passionate about. So uh, as we're heading up here, we're heading off into the darkening blue sky. We're crossing across that 10,000 foot mark, meaning that we can also head up into here and turn off our landing lights, which are go off above 10,000, as well as our taxi lights, our logo light, and our wing light can come off as well. The only thing that stays on is our position and anti-collision lights. Now, from now, it's uh, not a lot of work from here. Uh, the only things that we need to look at right now is making sure that we turn on our anti-ice uh, when the time comes and then uh, getting ready to go uh, for our descent by inputting uh, our approach speeds and inputting our lower altitudes into the MCP or the MCP or M, yeah, whatever. The MCP is basically this orange dialed thing right here, if you can see it with all the orange letters, that's basically called the MCP. Uh, it ties in with the autopilot uh, so we can manually enter stuff as well as tell it to take directions from the autopilot. And right now uh, it is taking directions from the autopilot that is being controlled by the FMC. So I'm gonna continue our ascent up here. Uh, if you look down here in this map, this map can give us a ton of data. I have things that I like. Uh, as you can see, that green kind of curved line, that is the predicted top of our climb at our current vertical speed. And as you can probably see there, our current vertical speed is 3,600 feet per minute. That's that little uh, dial right there on the very right-hand side of that left-hand display. Uh, which says 3600, zero, zero, that's 3600 feet. And you can see we're climbing through 15,000 feet right now on our way up to 28,000 feet. But as you can see, it says also TC. TC stands for our top of climb. So that is basically where our top of climb is going to happen. Now, if I zoom in out even further, you also see our TD come into frame right below EPH. Uh, that TD is our top of descent where we'll start descending out into Spokane. So there you have a little gist of things for you. We're going to continue climbing as well. As you can see, it is starting to get colder outside. You can see where it says TAT and it says plus six, that is six degrees Celsius 
outside. It's starting to get cold. So what we're going to do is we're going to come up to our upper panel here and we are going to turn on our anti-ice. Our anti-ice will prevent our uh, ice from building up on our wings, on our leading edges, and it will prevent our engines from building up ice as well, which can very, very dramatically affect both our performance in the air and our uh, keeping aloft as well. I mean, aircraft, no matter who it's made from, Airbus, Boeing, uh, Learjet, Embraer, whoever have you, all the planes are precision manufactured. If any little thing happens to these planes, they're going down. That has good and bad annotations to it. The good thing is that it does save on weight, meaning that the planes can fly faster, they can fly higher, they can cut through the air more efficiently, saving everybody money. But if we were to overdo it to provide redundancy, the planes are going to be slower, they're going to cost more, there's going to be a whole bunch of negative benefits, but the only positive benefit being if your wing was sliced off, there may be something that can help it. So you've got a trade-off there but nothing to be worried about. Rarely anything ever happens inside of a plane that needs to be addressed. And as you can see, uh, as we're coming in here, I'm not sure if the quality of the video will show up, but we're starting to see stars, if I can kind of show that off there. We're starting to see stars coming in to the frame here, which is very cool. So you can see very quickly uh, that we have now gone to negative six degrees Celsius. I just said it was plus six, now it's negative six. So it's still getting colder and colder. So uh, let's take a look around this plane here. Uh, as you can see, this is what the plane looks like uh, when it's flying off. And that is just oh, a stunning sh shot right there. Actually, I think that's going to be our screenshot. So I'm going to press, uh, I think it's V, and it'll take a screenshot. That's going to be our thumbnail for this video. But as you can see, the sun is starting to set, creating that nice orange haze and uh, it glows nicely on the side of this aircraft. I think Alaska's airline paint is freaking amazing. It's simple, straightforward, and they haven't changed it. A lot of airlines change their logos. Log logos? Logos. They change their logos throughout years, but Alaska Airlines has kept this for I don't know how long, but they've kept it for a long time. It looks good, it's simple, and it's memorable. Now, funny story, if you see on the tail there, you would quite obviously think that that was an Eskimo. Back when I was a little guy, and I mean I was little, 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 probably barely understanding stuff, I used to think that was a lion, because you can, I can kind of see his little poofy coat kind of looks like the mane of a lion. Uh, his facial features kind of look like a lion there. And you can see, I don't know what those are, but those things that are kind of above his head and to the left and right kind of look like ears a little bit. So I kind of equivalent that to uh, a lion. And I kind of think of the um, Wizard of Oz. There it is, the, the Wizard of Oz lion when I uh, assume that. So uh, moving on though. We'll take a look at these wonderful wing views. I mean, there are some really cool wing views uh, from within this plane that make it look fantastic, basically. <laughs> it makes it look good. Again, there's always that sense of realism that I really do like about this. So, as you can see, Mount Rainier is going into the distance as I take another sip of water. Oh, man, sorry. I'm talking too much just because I'm trying to fill time. A lot of the times, <laughs> believe it or not, uh, <laughs> nothing really happens in planes. Everybody's quiet. The plane flies. And it's, depending on the length of flight, is going to be a long time when you're sitting there, especially even with a co-pilot as well. I mean, you're probably going to converse with him for a little while, but that's about it. Um, so... A lot of it is quiet, kind of studying your charts, doing a lot of the uh, work that uh, comes with uh, flying a plane. And right now, we're kind of in the middle of doing our work. 
Uh, we are at the, our top of descent at 2,805 feet, or 2,800, 500 feet. Um, we're just going smooth right now. Uh, the plane is taking over everything. We're kind of just monitoring our instruments here. Nothing is going wrong. We don't have any fire lights. We don't have any warning lights. Um, we're kind of just here until our top of descent, which is going to be only in about 50-ish miles. So that should take us maybe five minutes or so uh, until we have to start our descent into Spokane. Again, like I said, very short flight, about only 40 minutes from takeoff to landing. So this video should only be maybe 50 minutes long maybe an hour uh it really depends on how long i took to take off and i think if i looked correctly it only took us about 10 or 15 minutes to take off uh, and that was with all of our steps now i'm doing this short flight for everybody uh and i'm sitting here and i'm paying attention to the flight i don't usually do that when i do flights within flight simulator what i'll do is i will uh set up a flight and go about my day because there happens to be a very fancy feature that PMDG, the software designers of this aircraft, have built into it. And if I go to the right menu here in the FMC, it is something called, if I can find it, options, simulation, there it is, there's something called pause at top of descent. And what that means is that when I have the FMC set up, when I have the autopilot set up, and when it reaches that TD, top of descent, it will pause the simulation. So when I come back from whatever I was doing, whether it was chores, whether it was hanging out with friends, whatever have you, I can unpause the game and start my descent into where I need to go. And as you can see here, there's also that IRS option with that fast 30 seconds or our realistic 15 minutes um, to allow us to take off easy and, and be in the correct uh, center. So uh, if you can see here, here's our approach reference page this is the page that takes in our destination data allowing me to set it up to land at the runway we need to land at now, like i said we're taking off at runway zero sorry we're landing at runway zero three and you can see we have our ils frequencies now when we start our descent i will explain a little bit more about what ils is uh, in short, right now, I will explain to you that it basically helps the plane land by uh, coming on to a frequency the plane understands and it will guide it down perfectly onto the runway. Although, although, let me say although, though, uh, although, though, I, I, I'm tired, okay? I'm tired. And I'm thirsty. And I took another drink. But... As I was saying, although I believe at this airport it's a little weird. Every time I've landed here, I've been kicked off autopilot in the last 50 feet, leaving me to land it manually. So I think at about 100 feet, I'm going to kick off the autopilot myself and land it manually. So you'll see how good I am at landing planes manually. So... Uh, we are just going to be chugging along here almost at our top of descent. Can, like I said, short flight. Uh, Alaska Airlines flies this flight who knows how many times a day. Um, and it's usually done, it's usually, usually, usually done by their Dash 8 aircraft, which holds about 100 people and their prop planes. Um, they have a bill, little bit lower cost to passenger ratio than these big jets do. Although... Uh, I did look it up, they're 737-500s, which they used for that route at certain times of the day, which is only about two or three times a day they use the big planes. When they do use those, uh, it's at peak times, and um, it's faster. Yeah, it's faster and higher and all that fun stuff. Um, I do actually have a Dash 8 installed with the Alaska Airlines delivery, but I haven't yet mastered it. The only plane that I've mastered is this 737. Now, I'm going to venture, 
and say, if you were to plop me down in a real 737 simulator, I bet that I could get mm, 97 to 99% of all of the procedures down if I had the correct materials in front of me. That means that if I had uh, the checklists, if I had a route information, I think I could very well fly an aircraft as a pilot than somebody taken off the street and said to do the same thing. But that's me. Like I said, I've been flying in this aircraft for whew, goosh knows how long. Uh, I know I've racked up a couple hundred hours within this aircraft learning all the procedures. And I mean all of the procedures. And I think I'm pretty much got it down to a science. And I'm able to do uh, a lot of things that I wouldn't be able to do if I was just a normal person flying the default FSX 737. Because the default FSX 737, well, isn't the best. Not the worst, but it isn't the best. A lot of more simplified controls, whereas about 99% of the controls on this plane actually work and do something in the plane. Which is pretty freaking fantastic. For me, at least. So let's take a couple more views here around so you can see our plane uh, as the sun continues to set on this wonderful day. And here's that flyby view. You'll be able to see the plane flying by. That wonderful Alaska Airlines livery flying away. Whee! With all of our passengers on board. Uh, what else views do we have here? We also have ah, our wing views. I love these wing views. I don't know why. Again, it's, it's, it's my love of the aircraft. It's something, but... This view right here is probably my favoritest view. My favorite. Favorite is the word? I'm going to say favorite. My favorite view is this right here. What's nice is this plane is ultra realistic. I mean, it does wing flexes. It does uh, stresses correctly. Uh, the, the, they basically worked with Boeing to create this aircraft. Which, again, pretty freaking fantastic. So we're going to head back into the cockpit here. We're coming up on our top of descent. My FMC should be alerting us any moment now, uh, which should say top of descent, reset the MCP, which I will reset it in a second here after I take a sip. And when we do that, we'll start our approach checklists. We will start our... Uh, everything we need to do to get ready to land again like I said pretty short flight as you can probably tell by how long this video is in total this is a real life flight this is about how long it would actually take as I hit the mic again I have a horrible time with hitting the mic you can see right here oh, there it goes reset MCP altitude resetting it down to uh, I believe it's about 3,000, I think we need to put it down to, which will be a nice way to intercept that glide slope. And that glide slope has something to do with the ILS and being able to come in at a nice angle to land the plane correctly. And as soon as we start our descent here, because even though it told me to reset it, we're still coming up on that top of descent. The computer knows exactly, and I mean precision exactly, when it should start going down. So we're going to wait for it to do it right now. <clears throat> I'm starting to lose my voice. This is now the second or third time that I've done this video for you guys because, unfortunately, I couldn't get my recording program to stay recording. And Flight Simulator crashed a couple times, so I had to reset. Hopefully, this is actually the final video to make it into the YouTube channel. <sighs> Hopefully. So, I think we're about to start our top of descent. Are we ready? 
and there we go. All right, we have started our descent into Spokane. Uh, a little things to keep in mind as I'm descending here, I'll point out some things that I usually keep an eye on. Uh, so we'll reference back here these two main glass panels in this cockpit. Uh, the first off, you'll see those pink triangles uh, starting to move. And basically, those triangles are basically how in line we are with our flight plan. As you can see, the triangle on the right-hand side is a little bit above that white dash. That means that we're going a little bit below how we're supposed to be going down. But that's a good thing. The bad thing is if we were above. That would truly be the bad thing. But we're not, so we're okay. Now moving on to that right hand screen, you'll also notice on the right hand side, you'll see that pink line with the sideways diamond. That thing right there that I'm zoomed in on. This is our vertical representation of how we are on the glide slope. That pink triangle is where we should be and those pink lines going out and touching the white ones, those are our tolerance zones. So basically that's how much of a tolerance we have uh, to continue going down uh, and staying within our glide slope. So to keep that in mind, uh, you'll also notice some things here. Uh, if you see that green text, it says decel. Uh, that's when we're going to uh, decelerate. Uh, and that's basically when we start putting down our flaps. And that's when we start putting down uh, our uh, landing gear and stuff like that. So, like I also said before, we're going to start up with our FMC and start our landing sequence. So, to do that, we're going to select our VREF speeds and our flaps. So we're going to go in with full 40 degrees of flaps, meaning we're going to land at about 128 knots. Now, what's great about the FMC is it also gives us the correct frequency that we need to tune to our navigation radios to be able to uh, be able to land correctly, safely, and without any issues. So. The ILS frequency is 111.10. So we're going to head on down to our navigation radios, which is, if I remember the correctly, there we go. Our navigation radios are these bottom ones that say NAV. It's 111, so we're going to tune to 111.10. And we're going to do that with both sides, just for redundancy. So if one radio were to uh, knock out we have our second radio as backup so there we go one ten ten and then as you saw we also got a frequency as i can get my there we go as i get my back thing back we had a frequency of zero two nine so we're going to go up to our uh control panel here and we're going to set our course indicator to zero two nine that is basically the heading of the runway uh, the runways aren't necessarily always at the same degree at which they're labeled at. So 09, it might not be 09, but 088, or 089, or 91, or whatever have you. So we want to tune to the correct frequent, or the correct heading of the runway. So we've done that, and we're all set up to go. Now, our next step is to basically look at two things. The first thing is when we're under 18,000 feet, and the second thing is when our uh, degrees outside gets in the positive of numbers. When we get below 18,000 feet, we're gonna flick on our landing lights, and when we get into the positives of degrees on the outside of our plane, we can flick off our anti-ice because it then would not become useful and we don't want to overheat the control surfaces of the aircraft. So, good to go so far. I'm going to continue on this landing with time to spare, probably, uh, for some fun, which will probably be taxing around into our gate, and I'll show you guys a shutdown sequence as well. Another drink there as I'm really starting to lose my voice. <coughs> Uh, yeah, so let me know how you guys like these types of videos with me flying, because I probably have a couple other shorter flights that we could do uh, in this plane, 
that would be fun and would still be in Flight Simulator. I, I, I'm branching out and trying new things. Uh, and that's what I've been told to do. Branch out, try new things, don't stay with one thing, because I know we've done a lot of GTA 5 videos. I know we've done a lot of Saints Row videos. I know you guys liked them. We'll still do them, but once again, branching out, starting new things. Coming in to Spokane. Uh, fun fact about this type of flight. Uh, it used to be in heavy competition with another airline called Southwest Airlines. Uh, Southwest has since taken out that flight plan. Uh, they don't fly directly, or they, they don't fly from Seattle to Spokane anymore. That is uh, reserved primarily for Alaska Airlines uh, because, well, unfortunately, Alaska's kind of kicked them out of that market. Uh, due to their better lower costs than what Southwest could uh, give you. So if you wanted to get from Spokane to Seattle and you didn't want to take Alaska Airlines, you're going to have to go via Southwest Airlines and probably either go down to... Uh, you'll probably have to go down to Oregon and then up to Seattle, I think. Yeah, I think that's what it would do. I think that's the flight that uh, goes like that. I think. Anyways, moving on. Continuing our descent, as you can see here, we're below 17,000 feet. We're going to uh, now turn on our landing lights, which will go on like this. And that and that and that and we're also going to turn on our wing and our logo lights as well and if I go outside you will see the wonderful kind of reflections and lightings up of the plane as we're heading off which I think again is so cool because a lot of planes even the default planes don't get this type of lighting correct it's very realistic and I love that sorry it's the little things that make it so cool. So we're going to continue to move on here as we're getting to uh, land very shortly. Soon. Another fun fact, by the way. Uh, I usually take this flight at least three or four times a year. Uh, and that is because I live in the eastern part of Washington and I have to get home to Seattle if you were to drive from where I live to Seattle or even Spokane to Seattle it'd be about a five and a half to six hour drive if I were to fly Seattle or to Seattle it would be an hour drive I live so close to the airport that it is convenient. That's right. It is convenient for us to go to the airport to fly. It's not an inconvenience. It's a convenience. We live that close. It's less than a 20-minute drive. It's about a 15-minute drive all the way out to the Seattle Tacoma International Airport, which is very nice. Very cool. Uh, where I live in Pullman, uh, we have a small airport that's serviced exclusively by Alaska Airlines, except the Tickets are about twice to three times as expensive, and that's because they only have three flights a day that are on their prop planes. So basically they can only take about 300 people out of my city during the holidays when there are about 16,000 people, 16,000, about 10 to 16,000 people in this town, half of whom, maybe more than half of whom, need to get back over to the Seattle area. Fun times, right? Totally. Well, anyways, we are getting close now. Boy, are we getting close. We need to make that right turn and then another left turn and we'll be lining up with the runway. 
drawn to a close really fast here. My recording says that we're about 56 minutes in. But uh, it's probably going to be a little bit less because I did have some times where uh, I was getting going. So maybe it's about 50 minutes in. Maybe. Uh, but we'll have some fun when we land in Spokane. Uh, one thing that I did do is I installed a scenery package for Spokane Airport. Uh, this is kind of an updated uh, package for the airport, uh, making it more realistic, because the default one wasn't that realistic, nor was it accurate. So uh, this one will be accurate, but I haven't tried ILS landings at it yet, so I'm not sure how well we're going to do. But we'll see. We're almost there. We'll see how fun this will be. So, continuing to come down here. About to get lined up. And all of that fun jazz that comes with landing an airplane. We're, I mean, basically we're all set up. We're going to set our auto brake to one. Uh, because a, a lot of that power is actually going to come from our reversers uh, when I do activate them. So, uh, auto brakes are one to max. There's a one, two, three, and max. One and two is usual normal settings. One if it's a bit shorter runway, or uh, sorry, two if it's a bit shorter runway. One if you're just generally landing and you know you have enough room, you use that. Uh, if it's a really, 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 really short runway or you uh, need to stop in a hurry, you'll use three. And if it's a complete I mean, complete emergency, you're going to use max, and that will most likely result in the wheels having to be changed, plus very strong words from your manager. Very strong words. But, nonetheless, getting close. One more left turn here as we continue to descend into that 10,000 foot range. Below 10,000 feet is usually where all the fun happens. Because that statistically is the most statistic point in which something bad could happen to your plane. Uh, a lot of statistics show that above 10,000 feet, you're fine. Most of the action has happened below 10,000 feet, usually when you're landing and taking off. Now, I'll bring this up because we're still flying. Uh, a lot of the issues nowadays is why do we have to turn off our electronic devices when we're taking off and landing? Now, the FAA rules have now said that they're going to say, well, you can have them on now. But I thought it was a good idea to have them off. Not because they interfered with anything outside, but because it caused you to pay attention during takeoff and landing, where it is statistically the highest rate of incursions, whether it's hitting a plane, a bird strike, having to ditch in the Hudson River, whatever have you. I think is a good idea, just because... It causes you to pay attention, and you can be much more alert if something were to happen. That's me, of course. But we're going to continue to land. So, as you'll see here, if I zoom into our center map, you'll start to see a dotted line show up. You'll see that dotted line. Uh, that is the approach path, the extended center line of uh, our approach, which we want to follow in. We're actually going to be a little bit to the left of it, but we'll be able to straighten it out as soon as we get uh, into view of the airport. So, we will continue to do that right now. As we line up, we should start to get our diamonds, which will show us how we are going to land. 
which will be a little bit further up here. I'm going to enable VOR lock. Uh, maybe I will. No, because apparently I'm not enabling VOR lock. <laughs> maybe because we're not uh, there yet. So um, what I am going to do, though, is I am going to increase our rate of descent just a tad here because we're a little bit too high. So usually a pilot will do this uh, when they are a little too high and they need to come in at a better angle. Uh, we're going to come down. It's only about 2,000, 2,700 feet, so it shouldn't be too bad and we'll be right where we need to be uh, at the time of our landing. I think I see the runway. Yep, there's the runway in sight. We're going to put our flaps to two. One degree, two degree. I'm a little bit too fast here, but that's just because I'm trying to catch up with our landing. I'm actually make this a uh, manual landing. Because why not? Oh uh, yes, we do need to turn off our anti-ice, because we don't need it anymore. And... We're still continuing down on our approach line. We're at 2,000 feet above. Still on our way down. Still having fun. Gonna put out some more flaps plus down gear. We're gonna arm our auto brake, and our auto brake allows us to uh, slow down faster once we come down. So we'll do that. So as I concentrate here and we start slowing down more, maybe the ILS is turned off with this new runway. So I guess I'm going to manually land it here. So let's have some fun with this, okay? Okay, we need to be down to 128. I can do it. 128. Flaps are fully going down now. Unless we get onto the approach lock, which it doesn't seem to be happening. Maybe. See the runway right there in front of us? Kind of monitoring everything here. So we get ready to go down. It's not looking like it's going to catch on. Fantastic. So that means that we'll start our descent manually. By me pressing the nose down just a tad here to start our descent into the airport. We are at our nice approach speed as well, so I should be able to land this with no issues whatsoever. Uh, those lights will help guide me in. I should be, uh, I should have uh, be guided in right now. Uh, for our straightness, but I just need to take over our vertical speed, which seems to be happening pretty good right now. So, sometimes this is how pilots actually do it. They actually land manually because they, they see the uh, joy in it still, and I do too. I mean, I, I do like manually landing, but I also like my auto landing because I have more confidence and I will not mess up because I'm not the one landing. So here we are, coming down nice and slow here. I think I'm a little bit to the right, but I can correct it. 
And I want to turn off auto throttle and put us to idle. Here we go. 30 degrees. Uh, oh dear. Oh dear. Oh dear. We're getting, we're getting blown. It's not me. We're getting blown around here. Oh, I hit right tire. And I've hit both tires. And we're down. Whew. That was not my best work at all. Not my best work. But I will take it as a landing. Because, I mean, it was maybe a 7 out of 10. Wasn't bad, but wasn't good. It was all right. So we're going to do our roll out uh, so we can turn off our runway here, which will be right here. And we'll make our way over to the gates where we will park up and I'll show you guys a shutdown sequence. So as I bring up my lighting panel here, we'll turn off our landing lights because we don't need them anymore and all the essentials. So we're now ready to head on over to our gates, which actually Alaska Airlines has their own gates uh, at this airport aside from uh, the gates that others use. There's actually two terminals. There's an Alaska-only terminal, and then there is the uh, everybody else terminal, <laughs> as you might say. So uh, we'll continue over there right now. This is basically the cargo area that we're taxiing by right now. We're also going to start putting up our uh, flaps. So if I get a good picture there, you'll be able to see our flaps coming up as we taxi down uh, the road here. Or the taxiway, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, we'll continue adding just a tad bit of thrust here to keep us going nice and smooth. See our landing gear nicely retracting up. I really do like that animation of retracting up into the wings. That's really cool. So I do need to look straight, though, so I can pick out our gates. Uh, that would be a nice view. So right now we're passing by the uh, everybody else gates and this left-hand side terminal that you see over there where those two prop planes are parked are our gates or the gates that uh, we, and I mean we as in uh, Alaska Airlines uses as their gates. Looks like we won't be at a gate with one of those automatic things, which is fine. So we'll take our turn right now into our gate area. And we'll take this first one. Because this is still within the Alaska Airlines gates, which is perfect. And we'll line up correctly on this center line as we slow down to stop at the line. That was a perfect stop, by the way. And we cut off our engines. And once we cut off our engines, we want to go to our ground connections because we only have a limited amount of time once those engines are turned off to connect up ground power. And we're now running on ground power. Now, because as you can see, we are not at a gate, what are we gonna do is we're gonna do this. After we turn off our taxi lights, turn off our anti-collision lights and we leave our logo and position lights on but if I remember correctly this plane is not equipped but we will actually go equip it again I'm gonna cheat a little bit here just gonna cheat a little bit uh, we are going to equip this aircraft with do, 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 air stairs so because there's no gate we will make ourselves our own gate by going like this doors, air stairs, and our left-hand side. So as you can see, our front door is opening for our passengers to get out. Plus, this is actually a really cool feature that's actually in 737s. Air stairs, direct from the inside bowels of the plane. We can now let people unembark from the aircraft. So while they're doing that, we as pilots are going to do our shutdown procedures, uh, which will 
after I get, there we go. Uh, we'll do our set down procedures. First off, we're going to turn on our lights so we can see a little bit more because I know you guys want to see everything. So let's get started here with our front panel, which will probably be that view better. Okay. Hydraulic pumps can turn off because we're not using our control surfaces because we're landing. We don't need our probe heats, nor do we need our yaw dampers. Where engines are not on, so we don't need our fuel. We are using preconditioned air, so we don't need those packs on. We are not using the APU, nor are we using the engine, so we can turn off those bleed valves. Uh, and we're not using our engines, so we can turn them into the off position. And that is now all set up. Now, because we are not going to be continuing on this flight, we are going to also turn off our IRSs, which is the top here, which are going off like that. So now our maps, as you can see here, aren't functioning correctly anymore because, well, we don't need them anymore. Other than that, all that's left to do is to turn off our emergency lights here. And if we were fully turning off the plane, we would turn off that battery switch and then disconnect our ground, and we would be in a now cold and dark state. But right now, we're letting out our passengers from this Alaska Airlines flight. So thank you guys so much for watching. Be sure to like, share, comment, subscribe. We hope you guys had a nice flight today. Please choose Alaska Airlines again for your service to wherever you need to go. Thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Craig Miller, and I'll see you guys in our next video.